Lecture 2.1, Rates of Change and Limits. Here we see Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming. Suppose you drive 200 miles and it takes you four hours. Then your average speed is 200 miles divided by four hours equals 50 miles per hour. Average speed equals distance divided by elapsed time, or delta x over delta t. If you look at your speedometer during this trip, it might read 65 miles per hour. This is your instantaneous speed. We know instantaneous speed differs from average speed. For this trip, for instance, you weren't going 50 miles an hour starting at your driveway or through the McDonald's drive through when you made a pit stop. A dramatic story. A rock falls from a high cliff. The position of the rock is given by y equals 16 t squared. Notice in this case we made positive the down direction. Because it's our problem, we can make positive in any direction we want. After 2 seconds, y equals 16 times 2 squared, or 64. The average speed, v average, is 64 feet divided by 4 seconds, or 32 feet per second. What is the instantaneous speed at 2 seconds? Instantaneous velocity is approximately equal to delta y over delta t for some very small change in t. In this case, we have 16 times 2 plus h squared minus 16 times 2 squared, all divided by h, where h is some very small change in t. We can use the TI-89 to evaluate this expression for smaller and smaller values of h. So we enter 16 times the quantity 2 plus h to the second power minus 64 divided by h, where h is 1.1.01.001.0001. And 0 0.00001. Once again, we use the vertical bar to mean such that. And we put our answers in a table. And we see as h gets smaller and smaller. delta y over delta t seems to approach 64. So the velocity approaches 64 feet per second as h becomes very small. We say that the velocity has a limiting value of 64 as h approaches 0. Note that h never actually becomes 0. The limit as h approaches 0 is written as limit as h approaches 0 of 16 times 2 plus h squared minus 16 times 2 squared all over h. We can do some algebra to evaluate the limit. Since the 16 is unchanged as h approaches 0, we can factor 16 out. We also expand the 2 plus h squared. Then we eliminate the parentheses, cancel the 4s, cancel an h in the numerator and denominator, 
giving us 16 times the limit as h approaches 0 of 4 plus h. But as h approaches 0, what's left is 16 times 4, or 64. So we see that the limit is not approximately 64, but exactly 64. New problem. Consider y equals sine x over x. What happens as x approaches 0? Graphically, we could use diamond y equal and graph y equals sine x over x. We set our window to go from negative 2 pi to positive 2 pi, and we make x scale equal pi over 2. Notice that the calculator has converted the exact values to decimal approximations. Then we press diamond graph. And there's our graph. Now it looks like y equals 1 when x equals 0. We can't really tell for sure because the y-axis covers up the, the point. What we really know is that because we're dividing by x, the function is undefined at x equals 0. So even though we can't see it, there should be a hole right there. Numerically, we can use a table of values. We'll start at negative 0.3 and make delta table 0.1. And when we look at the table, we see that as we get close to 0, y appears to approach 1. It's undefined right at 0. And then it's close to 1 again. You could scroll down to see more values. It appears that the limit of sine x over x as x approaches 0 is 1. Limit notation looks like this. We read the limit as x approaches c of f of x equals l. Or the limit of f of x as x approaches c is l. So in this case, the limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x equals 1. Notice that we have not yet done an exact proof, but we are pretty confident in our answer. The limit of a function refers to the value that the function approaches, not the actual value, if any. In this graph, the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x equals 2. Because coming from either side, either from the left or the right, it appears that the y value is approaching 2, not 1. It does not matter that the limit is 2, but the value of the function is 1. As long as we're looking for the limit, we don't care what the value of the function is. Here are some properties of limits. Limits can be added, subtracted, multiplied, multiplied by a constant, divided, and raised to a power. You can see your book for further details. 
For a limit to exist, the function must approach the same value from both sides. One-sided limits approach from either the left or the right side only. In this example, we will evaluate the limits for several different x values. At x equals 1, the limit as x approaches 1 from the left-hand side of f of x is 0. This negative exponent right here means that we're only approaching from the left-hand side. So as we approach x from the left-hand side, y appears to approach 0. The limit as x approaches 1 from the right-hand side of f of x equals 1, because as x approaches 1 from the right-hand side, the y value approaches 1. Remember, the limits are y values f of 1 equals 1. The actual value of the function is 1 because that's where the solid dot is. So we look and we notice the left-hand limit is 0, but the right-hand limit is 1. So the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x does not exist because the left-hand and right-hand limits do not match. At x equals 2, the limit as x approaches 2 from the left of f of x equals 1. The limit as x approaches 2 from the right-hand side of f of x equals 1. So approaching from the left and approaching from the right, the y value approaches 1 from either side. The value of the function is 2. But we're looking for limits, so we don't care what the value of the function is. But we see the left-hand, right-hand limits match. So we can say the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x equals 1 because the left and right-hand limits match. At x equals 3, the limit as x approaches 3 from the left-hand side of f of x equals 2. Once again, the y value is approaching 2. And the limit as x approaches 3 from the right-hand side is 2 because, once again, the y value is approaching 2. So we're approaching 2 from the left and approaching 2 from the right. In this case, the value of the function f of 3 is also 2. That's nice, but it's irrelevant because we're just looking for the limit. The limit as x approaches 3 of f of x equals 2 because the left and right hand limits match. The sandwich theorem. If g of x is less than or equal to f of x is less than or equal to h of x for all x not equal to c in some interval about c and the limit as x approaches c of g of x equals the limit as x approaches c of h of x equals l, then the limit as x approaches c of f of x equals l. Whew, that is a mouthful, but it actually makes sense when we break it down and look at a couple examples. The key idea is that f of x is always between g of x and h of x. And so if the limit of g of x and the limit of h of x approach the same thing, f of x is stuck in the middle. Let's see how that might work. Show that the limit as x approaches 0 of x squared sine 1 over x equals 0. Well, what we notice is if we just try to plug in 0, what we have is 0 times something that's undefined. So we can't just plug in 0. 
but the maximum value of sine is 1. So we know that x squared sine 1 over x has to be less than or equal to 1 times x squared or x squared. The minimum value of sine is negative 1, and so x squared sine 1 over x has to be greater than or equal to x squared times negative 1 or negative x squared. So negative x squared is less than or equal to x squared sine 1 over x, which is less than or equal to x squared. x squared sine 1 over x is sandwiched in between negative x squared and positive x squared. Sometimes this is also called the squeeze theorem because it's squeezed in between those two functions. Now we can evaluate the limit as x approaches 0 of all three functions. The limit as x approaches 0 of negative x squared is 0. And the limit as x approaches 0 of positive x squared is 0. Well, if they're both 0 and original function is sandwiched in between, by the sandwich theorem, the limit as x approaches 0 of x squared sine 1 over x equals 0. And we can take a look at this on the calculator. If we plot x squared, negative x squared, and x squared sine 1 over x, and set our window like this from negative 0.2 to positive 0.2 in the x direction, from negative 0 0.02 to positive 0 0.02 in the y direction. So we're zoomed in pretty close. We look at the graph of y equals x squared. y equals negative x squared. And sandwiched or squeezed in between these two graphs is the graph of y equals x squared sine 1 over x. And so we can see that because the first two graphs meet at 0, the y equals x squared sine 1 over x graph must also be squeezed through 0. And it's interesting to note that if you zoom in on this graph, no matter how far in you zoom, it still looks pretty much like this.